Let's close our eyes to pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this session we're getting into. Thank you, Lord, because we know you've called us as leaders in the fold, in the flock, in the church of the living God. We're praying, Lord, that we really serve you and serve your people in Jesus' name. We pray that you develop within us the qualities, the characteristics, the strength that we need to have. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said a good amen. amen. Thank you. We're going to sing that again. Keep me true, Lord. Jesus, keep me true. Keep me true, Lord. Jesus, keep me true. Let me hear you sing. Keep me true. Lord Jesus, keep me true. There is a race I must run. There are victories to be won. Give me power every hour to be true. Keep me pure. Keep me pure. Lord Jesus, keep me pure. Keep me pure, Lord Jesus, keep me pure. There's a race I must run. There are victories to be won. Give me power every hour to be pure. Keep me firm, keep me firm, Lord Jesus, keep me firm. Keep me firm, Lord Jesus, keep me firm. There's a race I must run. There are victories to be won. Give me power every hour to be firm. Keep me true. Amen. We're looking at the next message. Biblical pictures of leadership. The servant. In Luke chapter 22, I'm reading from verse 24. Luke chapter 22. Reading verse 24. And there was a strife, there was also a strife among them. Which of them should be accounted the greatest? And he said unto them, The kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them. And they that exercise authority upon them are called benefactors. But ye shall not be so. But he that is greatest among you, let him be the young, as the younger. And he that is chief, as he that does serve. For whether is greater, he that sitteth at meat, or he that serveth, is not he that sitteth at meat, but I am among you as he that serveth. The picture of the servant leader has been exemplified and elevated by the Lord Jesus Christ. In that passage of scripture that I read to you now, you see what the Lord Jesus Christ said is our Lord, is our master, and he is our mentor. And is the one that wants to mold us to the kind of leader that we ought to be. And then he points out to the disciples and said, Look at me and look at my leadership style. I am among you as he that serves. That's the picture of the servant leader. That the Lord Jesus Christ exemplified. And the Lord Jesus Christ exalted and elevated that picture of the servant leader. As we look at Philippians chapter 2, Philippians chapter 2, I'm reading to you from verse 5. Philippians chapter 2, reading from verse 5. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. As we talk about leadership, 
the Lord Jesus Christ himself has modeled leadership for us. And in modeling leadership for us, he now says we should have the mind of Christ in us. The mind of the servant leader. What mind should we have? And what example are we given here? What model can we, are we given here? In verse 6, who being in the form of God, thought it not trouble to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant. That's the model of leadership the Lord himself has demonstrated, has exemplified, has instructed, and has placed before us as a challenge that our leadership style ought to follow. He says he made himself of no reputation, and he took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men, and being found in fashion as a man he humbled himself and became obedient unto death even to the death of the cross and as we are being called to serve the lord in one capacity or the other as you come to this uh, planning meeting you are thinking of the capacity into which you are called that is as a leader and uh, those of us who are having uh, the uh, leadership uh, meeting in uh, various nations and uh, various states, you are called into which capacity? Are you leading the children? Are you leading the youths? Are you leading the women? Are you leading in the house fellowship? Whichever area of work, the Lord is telling us that the leadership style that he recommends and the leadership style style that he commands is that it will be that of a servant we are there to serve in second timothy chapter 2 verse 24 second timothy chapter 2 verse 24 and the servant of the lord must not strive the servant of the lord must not strive in the new testament uh, session of the new testament period the understanding of a servant was very clear to the people uh, number one there were masters that had servants and generally those masters did not have just one servant they had a number of servants what do we learn about them number one the servant never strove with the master and the servant of the lord must not strive as you come into leadership then and you see the picture of a servant you must not strive with the master not only that the servants of those days sometimes there'll be a head servant a chief servant that is placed on top of those other servants that will supervise their work that will report back and give the feedback to the master and if there's anything we know about those servants, they will not strive with the chief servant or with the head servant. And the Lord is telling us too, we're servants of the Lord. And we have the different areas of service. And we do not strive with the head servant that may be overseeing or supervising our work. Number three, those servants at that time, they were given the portion of the work they were supposed to do. And those masters actually gave them enough work that they didn't have time on any other thing. They didn't have time striving with one another either. And so the servants of the Lord must not strive. In the various areas of leadership where we are, the servants who are serving the Lord or the children, servants who are serving the Lord or the youths, servants who are serving the Lord or the women, servants who are serving the Lord with all the various sections, they do not strive among themselves. And now, the people that were serving, that's number four. There are times that those servants have been sent out. And those servants are to minister to some people. And the minister of the Lord or the servant of the Lord will not, serve, will not strive with the people that were supposed to serve. Serve them, don't strive with them. If you think of yourself as a servant, and you see yourself as a servant and the picture of the servant is very clear in your mind sometimes you come to the congregation and then you forget i am a servant to the lord but serving the congregation instead of serving the congregation we we'll begin to strive with them it's like the pastor is fighting with the church it's like the minister is fighting with the people he ought to minister to the servant of the lord must not strive one no strife or the master two no strife or the chief servant 
3. No strife among various departments of the work. 4. No strife with the people were supposed to serve, the people were ministering to. Come back to verse 24. And a servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach and patient, in meekness instructing those that oppose themselves. If God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth, and that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil, who are taken captive by him at his will. As I said, the picture, the image, or the model of the servant leader has been exemplified by the Lord Jesus Christ, exalted and elevated by the Lord Jesus Christ. He, Christ, is a supreme example of the servant leader. He did not only recommend servant leadership, he commanded it. Servant leadership is leadership at its best. When we are committed to service, servant leadership, however, must not be confused with lack of courage or weakness. That the servant is to serve, is to be humble. Humility does not mean weakness. In fact, if there is anybody that ought to be humble, it's the people that are strong. And then you put that strength in the hand of the Lord And you are still able to serve the congregation in all humility Servant leadership then should not be confused with the lack of courage or, with, or weakness Christ, he was a servant Moses, that was a servant Samuel, what a servant Elijah, a servant of the Lord Isaiah too, a servant Daniel, a servant Paul, a servant all these were servant leaders. Would you say they were weak? Not at all. You would you say they were cowards? Not at all. Would you say they were lacking in courage? Not at all. They were humble and they were servants, but they were courageous at the same time. That's the kind of leadership the Lord is calling us to. That we'll be able to show and reveal and paint this picture of the servant leader we divide the message to three parts number one proper recognition of servant leaders proper recognition of servant leaders number two personal reflection by servant leaders personal reflection by servant leaders number three purposeful reproduction of servant leaders purposeful reproduction of servant by servant leaders number one proper recognition of servant leaders let's come to first samuel chapter three in first samuel chapter three we're looking at verse nine first samuel chapter three verse nine therefore eli said unto samuel go lie down and it shall be if he call thee thou shalt say speak lord for thy servant heareth so samuel went and lay down in his place samuel had not yet known the voice of the lord the lord was calling him and as the lord was calling him he needed a good response or the right response and eli knew it was the lord calling the young man and then he said, when you go back to sleep, if you hear that voice again calling your name, the way you respond is this, speak, Lord. You are bringing your life under the Lordship of this one that is calling you. And when you bring your life under his Lordship, it's going to be your Lord, and you will be the servant for thy servant heareth. It tells us then that primarily, Leaders in the church, leaders in the fold, leaders among the people of God are supposed to be the servants of God first. And each leader is called to render service to God's people on the one hand and to render service to God's creatures on the other hand. We're entering service on two areas. Number one, God's people. That's the church. 
the people purchased by the blood of the Lamb. We're rendering service to them. We're to render service to God's people. Number two, we're to render service to God's creatures, even those who have not been born again. We're looking at Numbers chapter 12. Numbers chapter 12. I'm reading from verse 7 and from verse 8. Numbers 12, 7 and 8. My servant Moses is not so, who is faithful in all mine house. With him will I speak mouth to mouth, even apparently, and not in dark speeches. And the similitude of the Lord shall he behold. Wherefore then were ye not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? Many times the Lord actually called Moses servant and here in this passage in verse 7 my servant Moses and then in the, the last three words in verse 8 my servant Moses we as the leaders in the church are to be servants of the Lord and as servants of the Lord we serve we must have that in our mind whatever area of leadership that will be We'll be talking about the different areas of leadership Maybe in another message uh, But you will see that the calling of Samuel Was different from the calling of Moses And that was also different from the calling of Solomon That we're going to look at in First Kings chapter 3 But even though the description Or the mission statement Of those leaders were different Yet they were all called to the servants of the Lord the vision, the goal, the dream, the mission statement might be different as we go from leader to leader. And yet there is a common factor or a common denominator. That is the fact that we leaders are all servants of the Lord. In First Kings chapter 3, reading from verse 6, And Solomon said, Thou hast showed unto thy servant David, my father, great mercy. Solomon understood that his father, as a leader in Israel, was a servant of the Lord. Every leader is a servant, called to be a servant, a servant of the Lord. Thy servant David, my father, you have shown him great mercy, according as he walked, as he walked before thee in truth and in righteousness and in uprightness of heart with thee and thou hast kept for him this great kindness that thou hast given him a son to sit on his throne as it is this day then in verse 7 and now O Lord my God thou hast made thy servant king instead of David my father David his father was a servant of God and he now came to that same position as a king and yet a servant does the king ever think that he's a servant maybe they don't think like that in the world the people of the world why are they kings because of power because of control and because of authority and the people that exercise power the people that exercise control and those that exercise authority they do not normally think about themselves as servants but David was a king, yet thy servant David. And Solomon became king, yet thy servant Solomon. You have made him servant, yet thy servant king, instead of David my father, in the place, in the room of David my father. And I am but a little child, and I know not how to go out or to come in. Verse 8, and thy servant is in the midst of thy people. That we would understand like Solomon understood We have been called to be servants And we are to serve the people Sometimes we think the people are to serve us And they get on our nerves when they don't serve us And we get irritated and impatient when they don't serve us And it appears that we begin to even depreciate and belittle And want to knock them down and crush them When they don't serve us because we have the wrong picture in our mind we are to serve the people thy servant is in the midst of thy people which thou hast chosen a great people that cannot be numbered nor counted for multitude give therefore thy servant an understanding heart 
actually solomon was emphasizing and the more he emphasized it the more he should have understood hey i'm a servant in verse 7 i'm just a servant in verse 8 i'm just a servant and now in verse 9 i'm just a servant give therefore thy servant an understanding heart to judge thy people that i may discern between good and bad for who is able to judge this that is so great a people we understand then the picture we need to hold in our mind and the model we need to keep before us that picture that image that model of a servant what do servant leaders do number one servant leaders love the people number one servant leaders love the people you cannot lead the people you don't love you can drive them you can move them you can put pressure on them you can push them but you cannot lead them before you can lead people you must love them therefore servant leaders love the people and the love we're talking about is not a sentimental thing the love we're talking about is something that comes out of your will i will to love i decide to love i determine to love and it's an unconditional love you see if you don't understand the love of a servant leader you'll be waiting for the people when they do well i love them when they act right i will love them when they behave the way they ought to behave i will love them what if the mother waited for the baby to act right and to do right and to cry right and not to disturb her sleep before she loves the child the baby it will never work we are to get it started if you're going to lead the people you love them first love the people number two you lose or liberate the people i want you to have a picture in your mind that you have a, a sheep or a flock of sheep and there are some chains tying down the uh, tying down the sheep and then you beckon to the sheep with your hand with the wave of the hand follow me and they're all tied there and then you are walking away and you say when they are ready they'll follow me they will not be ready until they are loosed are there many of our people who are tied down and you have not loosed them and you're just saying they are not following leadership they are tied they are chained they are chained you break the fetters you break the chains you serve them first and in serving them you lose them do they have family problems are there some things in their mind tying them down binding them and because they have not been loose it's not possible for them to follow you or for them to lead for you to lead them before you can lead the people you must lose them and liberate them when people are bound with fear they cannot follow you cannot lead them and you know there are some people that they think i'm going to be a great leader and the people are going to follow me but what i'm going to do first before they can follow me i'm going to intimidate them frighten them terrorize them so that they will know i beat them to submission and then when they are grieved with fear and they are tied down with fear and when they see me they are all trembling with that chain on them then i beckon to them you are ready to follow me now aren't you no sir we're not ready you bound us and you tied us down and as long as we are bound and not loosed and liberated there's no way you can lead us loose the people liberate the people before you lead them number three listen to the people leaders must listen and if you're going to lead people you must listen to them what's their level of understanding what's the level of maturity what's the level of accomplishment what's the level of knowledge when you get to that location when you get to those people the very first thing to do is to listen to those people and it's as you listen to them you will say this is the level they have reached and this is the level i need to take them to listen to them before you can lead them number four learn of the people learn of the people what if jesus did not know the peculiarities of human nature what if jesus did not know that you cannot build a disciple in one day what if jesus had not known 
all that he needed to know about the individual disciples following after him he would not have been able to lead them learn you are learning from the word of God you are learning also from the people you are learning what they can bear that's why we are told that Jesus spoke parables unto them as they were able to bear and that's what Jesus Christ told the people many things I need to teach you I need to tell you but you cannot bear them now but when the Holy Spirit is come he will show you and guide you to all truth uh, you know sometimes uh, there are people uh, who are leading and they have not known their people they are not learning from the people they just read something last week and what they read last week challenged them at the level where they were this is great stuff this is good stuff and then they want to preach on sunday they don't understand that you have been a christian for 15 years for 18 years and you are just learning this one last week and the thing turned you on and excited you and you say the people must know this and then that congregation will have some people that the majority of people they just became christians maybe like two years ago maybe like three years ago maybe just recently that they became christians and they do not have everything that they ought to have you have been there 15 18 years and then you come on sunday and you want to load it on them and you say today we're going to learn a lot there's something in the word of god this will excite you this will interest you this is great and then you speak for about one hour and the people are looking at you like this what's he talking about and you're surprised they're not getting it you know what you didn't learn learn from the people You've been a Christian for so many years and you're just getting it last week. And therefore, you also you are patient for them and allow them to come a long way and to come to the place they ought to come to so that now you'll be able to teach them when they come to that level. Learn of the people before you lead them. Number five, lift up the people. Lift up the people. You know, there are people that want to lead and we're not serving the people we don't want to lift them up we want to lift up ourselves but lift up the people let them know the dignity of each one of them they are people of significance they are people of importance appreciate them exalt the goodness of god in their lives lift them up in order to number six lead the people love them before you can lead them loose them before you can lead them listen to them before you can lead them learn more of who they are before you can lead them lift them up in order to lead them we're told in Jeremiah chapter 7 Jeremiah chapter 7 I'm reading from verse 25 Jeremiah chapter 7 verse 25 since the day that your fathers came forth out of the land of Egypt unto this day I have even sent unto you all my servants the prophets rising up early and sending them daily rising up early and sending them the lord called the prophets here he called them servants all the prophets of the lord are the servants of the lord the prophets proclaim the might of god the truth of god and he teach the way of the lord and the word of the lord but they were servants all the same as we come to the new testament the leaders the teachers the preachers the overseers those who are placed over the flock of the lord were also referred to as a servant of the lord in romans chapter 1 verse 1 romans chapter 1 verse 1 paul a servant of jesus christ paul a servant of jesus christ called to be an apostle separated unto, unto the gospel of christ in galatians chapter 1 Galatians chapter 1 reading from verse 10 for do I now persuade men or God or do I seek to please men for if I yet pleased men 
I should not be the servant of Christ. That verse reemphasizes what we said before that a teacher, a leader, an overseer, a pastor, a prophet called to be a servant doesn't mean that he's going to be weak or is lacking in courage. When a preacher or a pastor is weak, lacking in courage, instead of leading the people according to the way of the Lord, the people are going to turn around leading him. And instead of being the one that is going in front of them, is going to come behind them, following after. And the leader is going to be the follower instead of being the leader. That we're called to be servants doesn't mean that we are, you know, so subdued and uh, we're so crushed that all we can do now is to follow the people and not follow the Lord. We're first of all the servant of the Lord, not the servants of the people. It's as we are servants of the Lord, we're able then to serve the people come to Galatians chapter 1 verse 10 again for do I now persuade men or God or do I seek to please men for if I yet please if I yet pleased men I should not be the servant of Christ but I certify you brethren that the gospel which was preached of me is not after man for I neither received it of man neither was I taught it but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. For ye have heard of my conversation in time past in the Jews' religion, how that beyond measure I persecuted the church of God and wasted it, and profited in the Jews' religion above many my equals in mine own nation, being more exceedingly zealous of the traditions of, of my fathers. But when it pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace to reveal his son in me that I might preach him among the heathen immediately I conferred not but flesh and blood he actually acted as a true servant of God there are some characteristics of the servant of God as you recognize your position and your calling and your ministry as a servant of God, appointed and chosen, directed to serve the people of God. Number one, the servant of God is humble. The servant of God is humble. In Matthew chapter 10, verse 24, the disciple is not above his master, nor the servant above his Lord. And our Lord Jesus Christ was humble. So, You'll be like the master. Number two, the servant of God is diligent and busy. The servant of the Lord is diligent and busy. In Luke chapter 17, I'm reading from verses 7 and 8. Luke 17, verse 7. But which of you, having a servant, plowing or feeding cattle, will say unto him by and by, when he is come from the field, go? and sit down to meet because he's been diligent he's been busy do give him time to go and rest he says well he will not and will not rather say unto him make ready wherewith i may sup and gird thyself and serve me till i have eaten and drunken and afterward thou shalt eat and drink well and well and in there that the servant of the lord must be diligent and busy once again, let me remind you that the notes you are taking are not uh, just, um, you know, writing what you are hearing. You are asking yourself, am I humble? In my ministry, in my leadership, in my service to the people of God, am I humble? Am I diligent and busy? Or am I lazy? Do I serve? As if I wanted to walk my fingers to the bone. Number three, the servant is gentle and patient. The servant is gentle and patient. Once again, no patient people are born. Patience is learned. Patience is a learned character. It's a learned quality. It's a developed quality. You need to learn it. We need to all learn it together. We are not born with it. We are born with impatience. 
and as leaders and as servants we need to be patient and gentle see every child if they wanted anything the child will be kicking and screaming it's not born with patience nobody is born with patience or gentleness we learn it it's a learned trait and you need to learn it too in second timothy chapter 2 verse 24 and the servant of the lord must not strive never but be gentle unto all men apt to teach patient ask yourself once again are you patient with the children in the children's section are you patient with the youth in the youth section or the things they do just get on you and you become so nervous and so impatient and you want to level the whole field run over them plant them cultivate them develop them and don't allow the natural impatience that you have you want to build all those young people up in one day and you want to teach them everything they ought to know just in a short space of time patience and gentleness number four the servant of the lord is faithful in matthew chapter 24 matthew chapter 24 we're reading from verse 45 matthew chapter 24 i'm reading from verse 45 who then is a faithful and wise servant whom his lord has made ruler over his household to give them meat in due season a faithful and wise servant to give them meat in due season how do you understand giving them meat in due season giving them making the program when it is needed not waiting for your own convenience but allowing the condition and the situation and the need in the fellowship to dictate when that thing should be given out not because i am tired now i've been doing quite a lot i've been pushed right to my limits and i don't think i can take on any other responsibility now in due season while the need is there in due season while the people are hungry in due season why did that area needs to be taken care of our faithfulness will show that we produce that program we give that program and we give the service to the people in due season at the time when it is needed blessed in verse 46 is that servant whom is lord when he cometh shall find so doing verily i say unto you that he shall make him he shall make him ruler over his goods number five the servant is watchful the servant is watchful luke chapter 12 verse 35 luke chapter 12 verse 35 let your loins be guarded about and your loins burn, and your lights burning and ye yourselves like unto men that wait for their lord when he will return from the wedding that when he cometh and knocketh they may open unto him immediately immediate service immediate response to the leading to the calling of the lord blessed are those servants whom the lord when he cometh shall find watching verily i say unto you that he shall guard himself and make them to sit down to meet and will come forth and serve them number six the servant of god is obedient the servant of the lord is obedient in ephesians chapter 6 ephesians chapter 6 reading from verse 5 servants be obedient to them that are your masters according to the flesh with fear respect honor with fear and trembling in singleness of your heart as unto christ not with eye service as main pleasers but as the servants of christ as the servants of christ as the servants of christ doing the will of god from the heart number seven the servant of god is dedicated to god number one is humble number two is diligent and busy number three is patient and gentle number four is faithful 
Number five is watchful. Number six is obedient. Number seven is dedicated to God. In Galatians again chapter one. Galatians chapter one. In verse 15. But when it pleased God. Who separated me from my mother's womb. And called me by his grace. To reveal his son in me. That I might preach him among the heathen. Immediately. I conferred not with flesh and blood. We come to point number two. Personal reflection by servant leaders. Personal reflection by servant leaders. This is calling us to some reflection. It's calling us to reflect or to think on our leadership. Have we been servants in our leadership style? In Mark chapter 9 verse 35. Mark chapter 9 verse 35. And he sat down and called the twelve and saith unto them, if any man desire to be first, the same shall be last of all, and servant of all. To be a transformed leader, each one must be a genuine leader and genuine servant. That means we'll have a genuine servant's attitude and servant's heart. The Lord said, if anyone wants to be first, let him be a servant, the servant of all. Such a leader, number one, thinks nothing of trouble or difficulty. I'm a servant. I've been called to do what I ought to do. And because I've been called to do what I ought to do, I do not think about the trouble, about the inconvenience, about the difficulty. The servant leader thinks nothing of trouble or difficulty. Number two, the servant leader pleads no excuse of impossibility. The master has decided this is what ought to be done. And he doesn't plead, but master, you know this is impossible. But you know this is difficult. But you know this is unachievable. But you know it is not possible for anybody to do this. The servant leader does not plead an excuse of impossibility. Number three, the servant leader will do the utmost to bring out the best in his people. You are a servant leader. And then the Lord has given you some people that you are leading, that you are guiding, that you are molding, and that you are mentoring. And you will do your utmost to bring out the best in those people. Number four, the servant leader serves for the good of the people rather than for personal gain. The servant leader serves for the good of the people rather than for personal gain. Now we're going to do some assignment. You want to consider 10 specific needs that you see in the people that you serve. Consider 10 specific needs that you, that you see in the people that you serve. Can you look up here please? You write 1 to 10. And let's uh, take a uh, the youth leader, for example, your youth leader. What are the specific needs that we see? Consider 10 specific needs you see in the people, that is, in the youth, in the teenagers that you are serving, that you are leading. I need a response now. I told you that this time things are going to be different. Number one, just raise up your hand. Specific needs. Let's put this congregation as a congregation of young people, youths. What are the needs we have? One, yes, my brother. Thank you, my brother. I need a sense of belonging. We need sense of belonging. Please write that down. Sense of belonging. Specific needs that you see in the youth leaders that you are leading. Any other answer? We're going to 10. Let's hurry up. Any other one? Yes, my brother. My brother Victor says uh, sponsorship. That uh, they cannot fend for themselves. And they cannot uh, provide for themselves. What are we doing to provide for them? And when we talk of sponsorship, they're not just talking of uh, sponsorship in going to school. That is necessary. And there are some good, good students who need to sponsor because they do not have the wherewithal. How they can be educated. But how about going to the camp? 
How about having Bible? How about having a particular retreat? What are we doing to sponsor them? How about some special programs that are going to benefit those young people and they need to be sponsored? That's number two. Number three now. Any other need? Yes, my brother. Thank you, Brother James. The care and attention. That's the need. Am I giving them the care and the attention that those uh, people need? We're trying to identify specific needs that you see in the people that we're leading. That's number three. Now, number four. Yes, my brother here. Understanding the academics. Let's just put that so we don't lump it up with other things. Uh, am I interested in their academics, in their success, that they will make progress? I told you in the first message about um, Thomas Edison and how the teacher gave him up. Are there some people that the schools have given up? You pick them up. You may not be able to actually teach all those things by yourself, but you can find teachers that you can link up with the needy students and then they'll be able to help them. Then, then another thing a brother spoke about their spiritual life too that want to help them and groom them and develop them yes I'm looking for number five now the, yes the hand there thank you brother from Aki. that's a brother from Egypt uh, we need to know how to overcome temptation and uh, uh, young people they need to do that too I might just tell them overcome overcome I might showing them how they are going to overcome I'm looking at specific needs in my ministry towards the young people and I'm not just telling them do it without telling them how to do it and then when they are failed and falling into temptation we're not uh, saying well they are failed we're abandoning them there's no point uh, you know staying with the youth or teaching them they will not catch it let me go to the serious area and i don't want to do youth ministry anymore i'm going to the adult section we are to teach them how they will overcome temptation and be victorious number six now yes my brother uh, yes uh, break job please Thank you, brother. Encouragement and motivation. And there are there are times when those young people are just discouraged. Not only discouraged, they are in despair. And some of them might even go into depression. Have you heard about uh, the high rise of suicide among uh, young people? It will surprise you sometimes. The notes those uh, young people, those who have committed suicide, the notes they wrote uh, behind, I'm taking my life. Daddy doesn't love me. Mommy doesn't love me. And nobody loves me. There is no point in living. I can never amount to anything. Instead of living a miserable life, let me end it up and let me die. Some little, little things that discourage them, that depress them. That if you are near, if you are available, you'll be able to touch them, encouraging them, motivating them. Number seven now. Uh, yes, uh, brother in glasses there visitation and follow but let's take uh, that word visitation we're not taking that visitation as you know the regular conventional thing uh, sometimes we are visiting not because we want to go and preach those young people just to, i just showed up uh, you know timothy i just showed up to just let you know i've been thinking about you i know i see you in the fellowship but i just like to come and see in your house where is mommy where is daddy and to know your brothers and to know your sisters and just to make you to understand you have you know i'm not just your teacher i'm like your senior brother in fact if i could say that without making you to feel that you should lose your responsibility or your attachment to your father i am your daddy and i'm just thinking about you every time i didn't come to preach i didn't come to embarrass you ask did you do your quiet time this morning and did you read you know uh, how many verses of the bible did you read i'm not coming on you know to put you on guilt trip i just come to tell you how you are you doing i love you I appreciate you. You are facing some challenges. Remember, there's somebody thinking about you, and I'm praying for you too. You're visiting them, and you are uh, you are following them up, and then you stand up. You say, "I'm going." Then is the child that will pull you and say, "Ah, ah, you're seeing and teach me Bible before you go, and you'll pray for me before you go." Now that they stretch up their hands, I want to get something from you. Then in that visitation, you are not bringing some knowledge to them. I'm looking for number eight. The things. Uh, do I have anybody at the back? Just stand up and shout it at me that you know you, you are youth and uh, you want yes brother there okay educate them of the peril of HIV AIDS educate them of peril of HIV AIDS ah, look up here for a moment let me let me uh, do something now uh, that brother writing I said look up here thank you very much you know you have to tell this young young people teenagers that they ought to look up what they are writing now for the next 10 minutes, don't think about an elephant. 
be obedient don't think of an elephant i said don't think of an elephant what are you thinking about educate them of the danger and the peril of hiv aids and so we go to those young people young people you know hiv aids is prevalent everywhere don't 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 and if you emphasize don't 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 too many times they're going to go and experiment don't think of an elephant that's what you're going to be thinking about how do you help those young people fill their lives with positive activities that will divert them away from all the things that young people do that will ruin their lives and you don't go to those young people and every time you come to the young people children young people we're warning you if anybody dies if anybody perishes now your blood is no more on me i'm saying don't commit fornication don't do this don't do this and they were explaining every time explain every time don't 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 if you emphasize too much of don't you're going to find out that that's exactly what you're going to be thinking thinking about bring positive programs to their lives positive programs that uh, foster interaction between the boys and the boys and the girls and the girls and even be between the girls and the boys and you are there to supervise and you are there to look at the things they're doing and as an adult all their games and all they see you are developing them to do because they do it your presence uh -uh, that's a mistake don't do that and uh, no our love and fellowship is not going to go beyond you know there is a line there's a limit how many of you young people know that you know when you uh, get near the river at the brink there the border there don't look too much at that image there because you know i read about a, a particular child you know I'm, I'm talking to you young people now he, this child he had never seen his image on the at the sea at the river and then he was just at the side of the wall there all of a sudden he looked at his image he smiled and that thing smiled back at him he didn't understand that this is just a reflection of himself he moved his hand and then the thing moved the hand and uh, eventually so he became inquisitive children young people say inquisitive and sami he became inquisitive and then when he became inquisitive he said this fellow that if, if I, this even looks like my twin brother looks much like me i want to go and visit him and then he jumped inside and he drowned and he killed himself young people you know what i'm telling you i'm telling you that if you're inquisitive i want to experiment i want to find out you may jump into the river and instead of seeing you as a bank manager as a doctor eventually i don't see you on top i see you beneath the sea of danger and death now number is it number nine now number nine yes they hand over there the choice of friends the choice of friends we need friends in our lives young people and uh, you know we need to choose good friends that will move us forward and now number 10 yes my brother here career guidance what am i going to do i'm good in the arts i'm good in science i'm good in languages i'm good in this and i'm also good in what i'm good what i'm doing with my hand i'm a practical person as well as a theoretical person but i'm having a crossroad now before me which road will i follow career guidance and so i'm leading now you see what we have done here you are a youth leader you are a youth minister and you instead of just going to the fellowship what are you going to do today we're going to teach what are the specific areas of ministry that we ought to have with these young people i don't know i just know i'm going to teach and so we go on teaching how many weeks how many months how many years and we're not producing anything out of those young people we can do what we have done now with the children we can do what we have done now with the women ministry we can do what we have done now with the full-time workers we can do what we have done now with our districts and with our zones with every area of the work and so you will do that later during your free time and consider 10 specific needs that you see in the people you are serving in the people that you are leading and god will help us to fulfill our ministry in jesus name we're looking at um, we're looking at colossians chapter 4 colossians chapter 4 and we're looking at verse 17 colossians chapter 4 verse 17 here it tells us and say to Archippus, take heed to the ministry which thou hast received in the lord that thou fulfill it 
think about your ministry consider 10 specific needs that you see in the people you're leading in that ministry and then one by one have identified number one if i have identified number one what strategies do i need what plan of action do i need what activities and projects do i need that will make me to fulfill that specific need number one now number two this number two am i going to follow the same method or am i going to have some other approaches to be able to achieve this uh, specific need of number two it's as you consider that and you give yourself to them you'll be able to fulfill the ministry we're coming to point number three point number three the purpose uh, sorry purposeful reproduction of servant leaders it's one thing for you to uh, be a servant leader it's another thing for you to be able to put produce or reproduce a servant leader moses produced a joshua elijah produced an elisha and david produced a solomon and then you know daniel and his friends daniel was instrumental to the encouragement and the uplifting upliftment and the development of his friends shedra meshach and abednego and then you know that jesus produced the apostles and paul the apostle produced timothy and silas and many many other people or titles we're looking at john chapter 14 verse 12 john chapter 14 verse 12 verily verily i say unto you he that believeth on me the works that i do he shall do also and greater works than these shall he do because i go unto my father he that believeth on me the works i do he shall do also the works i do he shall do also the works i do he shall do also uh, let's let's think about what jesus did not have before we think of what jesus had one jesus did not have envy jealousy do you know there are some leaders that have envy and jealousy if they see some upcoming leaders and those upcoming leaders are being effective and successful and they are pungent and powerful and uh, the lord is actually taking the spirit and the power the knowledge the influence the possibilities in the life of the leader and is putting it on some upcoming leaders these uh, leaders they become fearful it's like uh, they feel insecure insecurity comes in and because of that insecurity they begin to clamp down and they begin to crush and they begin to speak against them and they begin to destroy them and they begin to look for some things that are of no consequence to level it against those people and the real reason is that the man is feeling insecure he is feeling insecure because there are people now that are growing up and they can be like him and they can do what he's doing uh, let's say for example we're at the retreat and you know you are preached and by the grace of god you are effective and you are going to be more effective in jesus name and then here comes another person we almost did not even know him we're giving him the first chance to even preach in our easter retreat at this time and the fellow comes up and he he, he preaches and they carry the people along and as when you were preaching you saw one person two people there they were sleeping dozing and nothing wrong with your message maybe they were tired but this fellow comes on because it's a new voice and it's a new face what's he going to say to sleep get away from me i want to hear what this fellow will say and then he begins to preach even his voice even the quotation of the bible even the interpretation even the illustration that is given and the inspiration that is coming on and the people we didn't know when the people started clapping he said something and the thing was so challenging and he pinched them it was pointed and direct, they started clapping and there you are the overall leader they didn't clap when i was preaching no it's not because uh, you know your message was not good it's because they're used to you that's why they didn't clap you've been preaching to them for 10 years and we've seen good good things and anytime you say any good thing that's what they expect the good things to say will not surprise them but they are surprised that this person is saying something that's why they are clapping not because it's better than you are but you think ah be careful here if i'm not careful this fellow will outshine me and you destroy them and you don't have the mind and the attitude of jesus what do they do in some of these countries in africa 
a leader rises up either by coup or by vote or whatever and then when he rises up and gets to the throne he looks around all the elites in that country all the great people in that all the people that can compete in that country he finds something first of all he puts them in life imprisonment after that he sends privately when the noise is down he sends privately into all those places and kills all of them so that all the people that are remaining nobody can compete and nobody can you know say vote for me who are you going to vote for all the good good people are dead and gone and you know there are some leaders that try to do like that you don't kill them physically but you are jealous and you are envious and you are not happy that your children are going beyond you everything will change in Jesus name Jesus did not have a jealous spirit a jealous attitude and he was not insecure he was secured he even said that more than what I've done you will do how is that Lord Jesus? Well, because I, I don't live three and a half years. If I stayed for 30 years, I would have done more. But Paul is going to stay more than three and a half years. And Peter is going to stay more than three and a half years. And John is going to spend more than three and a half years. Therefore, the works I do, they will do. And when they have done that, then they will begin to do the things I didn't have chance to do. I could have done them too, but no chance. Three and a half years is too small. And therefore, we understand the people we are bringing up, let us pray. They will be like us. I said they will be like us and when they are like us we will not be tell me out loud jealous how do we do this how are you going to reproduce uh, people that are servant leaders like yourself one and it's, this is VIP again VIP one vision illumination and perception uh, first of all is vision have a vision I want to grow the people I want to develop the people I want to lift up the people. I want to energize the people. I want to empower the people. Have the vision of what you want to do. Illumination. Let the light of, of the Lord shine in your heart. Perception. And perceiving those people, they can do what they ought to do. Number two, VIP. Value, influence, and principles. Number one, there is value. What do you put value on? Do you put value on people or on property? The people that have the priority in your life, are they people or the things that are priority in your life, are they people or property? Value. Value the people. Then influence them. And then develop sterling, standing qualities and principle in them. Number three. VIP again. Vigilance, instruction, and perseverance now these people that you have a vision about that you are going to develop them and you have put value on them you want them to be somebody to be something be vigilant over them be watching over them vigilance then instruction and then you are instructing them you cannot give all the instruction in one day but you give the instruction that is appropriate that is limited to the need of today and then perseverance never give up on the people that you are training remember your purpose is to reproduce servant leadership in them number four vip virtue impartation and purity virtue impartation and purity you show them the virtue and then you show them how to have it you know many times we just tell the people be gentle be kind be compassionate be patient be honest have integrity that's okay that's okay that's all right but impart it to them too impart it to them too speak good words of impartation to them good words of impartation and uh, you know, sometimes I just seeing them I see you more being, being more gentle and being more loving I see what you don't see I'm sure you are worried about yourself you are saying oh, why am I so impatient but I see you are going to be a patient man you impart those good qualities by the word of your mouth unto them and remember now we are talking about the various sections in which we are ministering in that section impart virtue and purity number five VIP visibility involvement and and uh, performance uh, that means if you are going to actually reproduce the servant leadership in the people be visible let's see you how the Lord is reproducing it in your life too and as we see how the Lord is doing it in your life we can mirror your life 
that is we can allow the reflection of your own life to come upon us uh, because it is what you do actually that is going to be mirrored is going to be produced in the people visibility be visible involvement be involved with the people and performance do it while the people are there number six vitality inspiration and personality development vitality inspiration and personality development vitality let them see that you are strong not strong to the boys trust or to bully anybody but just to know that the strength of the lord is there and the energy of the lord is there and that by the grace of god you are empowered by the strength of the lord that's what we call vigor vitality of vigor inspiration be an inspiration to the people the way you carry yourself and the way you look and the way you stand and the way you interact with the people like even when you are not preaching another person is preaching and your presence there and the way you participate even in your quietness should be an inspiration to the people and uh, what kind of personality should you develop uh, what you should do is of the people that you know in the bible take joseph for example or take samuel or take aaron or take moses or take elijah or take elisha or take daniel or take david or take samson or take paul or take peter if we line them up and we say look at these different personalities here is aaron here is samson here is elijah here is daniel pick one if you just decided this is the kind of personality i want to be pick one how many people are picking aaron nobody you pick your you pick your own after you pick your own you will be looking at that personality every time and you say lord this is what i want to be i read of a particular individual now he had a predicament actually it was something that he was born with he was bent down like this he couldn't look up and his back is like it was incorrigible there was nothing medical science could do but he didn't like that shape didn't like that personality it made him to be a man with no self-esteem no self-confidence you know when you are walking about all bent and you cannot look up even the people that are younger than you are you're always trying to look up to them and this fellow said i don't want this and it must not be and so what he did is that he called an artist he said artist you are going to do something for me look at my facial appearance and look at my body except for the deformity help me draw a good picture of myself standing straight and standing erect and then that artist did it was a good job and this he said i love this this is what i want to be and then he put it in the yard not even in the room in the that's in the courtyard and put it on the wall and every morning after taking breakfast and after uh, washing he will go to that uh, image he'll be looking at that image trying to stretch and trying to stretch and he didn't make it the first day but he went there every day perseverance and persistence that's the name of the game and he kept on doing that and after a number of years the day came when he stood straight like this eyeball to eyeball face to face with that personality that he had been dreaming of and practicing that he wanted to be choose your personality and said this is the kind of person i want to be is it charles finney is it wesley is it T.L. Osborne? Is it Billy Graham? Whoever. You just choose your own and put that picture there. The picture is in your mind. And you're saying, with prayer, with reading, with study, with flexibility, changing some things in my own life, things that not ought to be there. I keep on changing and changing until I match that personality. And when that is being done in you, help the people too, the people who are in your ministry, under your leadership, vitality and vigor, inspiration and personality development. Number seven, vow interpre in implementation and progress it's like it's a vow i am going to be the servant leader the lord has called me to be all the selfishness and all the insecurity all that i i i, I pack away i'm going to develop many other people too the challenge i'm now giving you is how many leaders are you committing yourself to reproduce yourself in don't stop and don't pray yet until you write that down how many leaders are you saying god helping me god changing me god transforming me 
I am going to raise up, I'm going to reproduce real, competent, effective servant leaders. How many? 100? How many? 1,000? How many leaders are you going to raise up, to develop? You're going to put that down on paper. Go, uh, look back home now. Let your mind go back home to the congregation and to the people that are there. These people that are just there, sitting on the bench there in my congregation, those young people, those women, and those men, those new converts, those long-standing believers who are there, and these believers that are always giving excuses, we don't have time, we don't have time. Can I take up the challenge and reach out to them and reproduce in them effective servant leaders? How about those women? Can you make up them effective servant leaders? Write the number down. After you've written the number, then you get up and say, Lord, help me. There is a race I must run. And because there's a victory to be won, give me power every hour. Not to shift my focus, my attention away from this goal that you have set before me. And it shall be done. Let's rise up and pray. We're servants. Let's serve the people. Don't allow the thought of insecurity. You're secured in Christ. No jealousy. No envy. God is going to use you to develop other people. His hand is upon you. The spirit of the Lord is upon you too. Rise up to the challenge. Rise up to your calling. You don't belong in the valley. You belong in on the mountain top. How many leaders are you going to reproduce? No selfishness. No insecurity. No fear. If they can preach as well as I preach. If they can administer and organize as much as I do. If they can manifest as much gift as I manifest. If they can be as effective as I am effective, does that take anything from me? No, not at all. It expands the kingdom of God. It builds the kingdom of God, not my empire. What are the specific things you are going to do to achieve those things the Lord has led you to write down? Heavenly Father, we thank you for this session again. Thank you because you have called us as leaders. You have called us as servants. And Lord, we are going to serve you with the servant attitude and spirit in Jesus' name. Lord, we pray you make us effective. Help us, Lord, that we will not be going about with feelings of insecurity, low self-esteem, and lack of self-confidence. But Lord, in the strength of the Lord, with the joy of the Lord, we will move on and we will do the work we have called us to do excitedly in Jesus' name. And we pray, Lord, all the specific things we have written down. And the more we'll see right now, you help us to develop strategies and plans of action. They will be done in Jesus' name. This year will be a year of progress, a year of promotion, and a year of success and progress in the things of the Lord in Jesus' name. Let your hand be upon your people. Lift your people higher in the service of the Lord. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray. And everybody said...